Thank you. Thanks. Um, well, thank you for the welcome, and thank you for having me here today. It's a, a pleasure to come to Ottawa and get to know some new people and share some of the interesting stuff I've, I've discovered about coroutines in the last couple of months that I've uh, been playing around with them. So as Wes said, my name is Mauricio, uh, Mauricio Sierra. I'm an Android developer at Shopify, but I work in Toronto. Um, and the, these last few months, I've been playing around with, with uh, well, Kotlin more seriously, and coroutines, just like spare time, really mostly for the purposes of um, this particular talk that I've given uh, twice before. And I will say it's a pretty dense topic. I don't know. I'd like to get a show of hands to see how many people have actually played around with coroutines in Kotlin before. Um, we have one person. OK, well, a few. OK, not a lot. So I'm going to take it slow, and I will stop at the end of every slide or any um, important concept. And I'll give everybody a chance to sort of collect the thoughts and ask me any questions. If anything is not clear, uh, I will either explain it if I feel like that needs to be explained at that particular point in time, or I may just say we're going to move past it, um, leave that sort of untied, and then come back to it later if I know that it's going to get explained with something that we'll see further further on ahead. Um, I'm saying this because that's basically how I learned this. That, that was my life for a couple of weeks when I was trying to learn coroutines. I had to be comfortable being uncomfortable and not knowing what was going on for, for quite a bit of time. And then at some point, when you start actually coding something and putting things together, things just sort of start to click. So yeah, you maybe will leave here tonight and still not understand exactly what's going on. But um, play around with it. I'm going to share the source code. And it's very, very short and very simple. And you can play around with it and get more comfortable. And so yeah, without further ado, I'm going to start talking about the coroutines. So the first thing I feel like we should do is define a coroutine. Uh, some of you may have seen it in school or in other languages. Uh, some of you may have seen it just as a, as a concept and never actually applied in practice. So the first thing we're going to share with you is a, a definition of, of coroutine that is in The Art of Computer Programming by Donald Knuth. Um, not that anybody really has read that book, hopefully, but <laughs> um, if you're brave enough and have gone through it, then this is the definition that you find in there. And it's actually not defining coroutines directly, it's using subroutines to define coroutines. It uses subroutines because that's what you're all very familiar with, right? We use it every day. Every time you declare a, a function, you're defining a, a subroutine. And so a subroutine um, implies this concept that there's a main routine. So you have a main routine that calls upon a subroutine. And there's this sort of uh, master-child relationship, right? master-slave relationship. So that's exactly what Donald Knuth does here. He, he says subroutines are special cases of more general program components called coroutines. And then he contrasts subroutines and coroutines and says that the relationship between uh, coroutines is completely symmetrical as opposed to the um, asymmetry that exists between a main routine and a subroutine. Right? So again, this is still very abstract. Um, I'm going to explain it with some diagrams. But um, the, ma the main concept here is that a, a coroutine is basically um, two routines that collaborate with each other, as opposed to calling a routine, exp uh, waiting for, for, um, for the result and resuming. Right, Donald Knut. So we just talked about subroutines. And I'll put it in context. So at least maybe this will help you understand my uh, poor diagramming skills. But you can think of your main, main routine, calls a subroutine, whatever you want to call it. The subroutine executes, runs to completion, returns a value or void, um, and then uh, control resumes on the main routine, and it continues execution. So that's what we're all very familiar with. There's nothing, nothing new here. And now we move on to cor to coroutines. I, uh, on purpose, I named them something else. I didn't use um, main at all because we want to talk about this symmetry that exists. We just have two coroutines. We have coroutine A and coroutine B. And I've also 
not used the term call or return. I've used resume and suspend. So a call routine will, will suspend itself and it will yield control to another call routine or it will explicitly resume another call routine. And this is what coroutine A is doing here. And you can see that when coroutine B, after it's done some work, some amount of work, it suspends itself as well and resumes coroutine A. But it doesn't end there, right? It keeps going. And that's because then coroutine A can actually go and invoke coroutine B later on. And that's the concept behind coroutines. That's really, uh, I guess, at an academic level, an abstract level, that's what a coroutine is. And then we're going to move on to Kotlin and Kotlin's implementation of coroutines. And you're going to say, well, wait, what are, like, there's nothing like what you said at the beginning. And that's because it's subtle. Like, it's, it's there, but it's sort of behind the scenes. And then what I'm going to do next is just explain um, what Kotlin has done with coroutines, how they've uh, implemented them how to use them, what are some common uses for them, the benefits, why you would ever want to use them. And if we have some time and you guys feel like it, maybe we can try and tie it back to this. But that may be a little too much at the end. So we'll see. So as I mentioned before, we're going to talk about why use coroutines. And this is specific to Kotlin now. Uh, why would you use a coroutine in, uh, in Kotlin? Well, it's. Once you wrap your head around it, and once you start looking at it uh, in actual code, you'll see that it's a different way of writing asynchronous code, and it it doesn't block it doesn't it doesn't block the thread of execution um, of your code, uh, and you can express it in a way that's easier to understand. It looks more like um, a sequential program. And there's not a lot of callbacks which is my next point. It helps you avoid messy callbacks that some people refer to as callback hell. I also touched on this a little bit. It expresses asynchronous flow um, sequentially. It's a way to, to look at asynchronous execution in a sequential way. And another very interesting point is that um, the coroutines in, in Kotlin are very cheap. So uh, you, you're not spinning off a new thread for every coroutine. You're, you can run multiple coroutines on the same thread. And that means that there's no context switching across threads. And therefore, you can, you can sp um, run a lot of um, computations on separate coroutines without switching threads. And it's a lot faster. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this point and show numbers, because you can Google that, and you'll find a lot of articles that have done benchmarks. Um, basically, things that if you spin off a million threads and each thread all it does is return an atomic integer, and then you want to add them up, you know, with threads maybe it will take hours, and people have gotten tired of just waiting for them to finish. And with coroutines, it can take you less than 10 seconds. So it's um, very cheap for things where you just want to execute a small job in a separate thread and you don't want to spin off, sorry, you want to execute a, a job asynchronously and you don't want to spin off a new thread. So before we get into this, um, the next concept, are there any questions about the, the motivation of coroutines or anything that I've explained so far? No, okay. So I'm gonna move on to, to some, some concepts now. And we're going to get into code really soon. So just hold on. <laughs> OK. The, the first thing I want to explain is suspendable computation. So suspendable computation is a term for a block of code that uh, executes without blocking uh, a thread. So here it is, non-blocking code that can be suspended and then resume later. This is an important concept uh, because it's really what a coroutine is. When we, when we start a coroutine in, 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 in Kotlin, it's a unit of suspendable computation. And the, the main thing here is that it can be suspended 
and then resumed. And um, here we go, the first little piece of code. This, this function called create coroutine, it's in uh, Kotlin's coroutine library. And that is the basic way to create a coroutine. We're gonna look at some higher level functions very soon. And you will rarely, especially when you start playing around with this, you will rarely use create coroutine directly. You'll be using it indirectly through some higher level functions. But create coroutine is sort of the, the basis of, of any, any coroutine library code. So unless you're writing libraries that are sort of advanced and use coroutines, you will likely not be using this function at all. And then I'm also going to take this opportunity to introduce suspend. And there's a weird line there. I don't know why. Suspend is a keyword. And suspend is actually the only language keyword, like the, the only Kotlin language um, support for coroutines. Everything else is going to be functions around it, right? But um, suspend is the only keyword you will find that actually has anything to do with coroutines. And I'll explain why um, that's relevant very soon. And as I mentioned before, it's the building block for higher level uh, coroutine libraries. Any questions about suspendable, oh, I can go back if you guys want, suspendable computations? Still sort of abstract, but we're already starting to get into some, some cutling code. We're good? Okay, so from here we're gonna jump into suspending functions. So suspending functions is now getting closer to what we're actually going to write when we're using coroutines. So when, you're, when you are going to, to make use of this coroutine library, what you need to do is write functions that can be suspended. Right? Um, let's see what we have written here. Once you've created a coroutine, you can call suspending functions. And calling these functions may suspend your, your coroutine. And uh, an important thing to note is that any function that's declared as suspending can only be called from a coroutine on, or from other suspending functions. So that creates uh, an interesting problem. Um, a lot of you may be thinking, well, how do we even then start running um, a suspending function, right? Like, if, if we can only call it from a coroutine or from another suspending function, then how do we get there? So that's coming up in the next slide. But the the interesting, interesting thing that we're going to look at here is um, our blocking code, the code that you normally, um, in asynchronous uh, programming, the code that you would write as blocking code and that you'd want to execute in a separate thread, the analog analogy is, is that, really, in coroutines. That's your suspending function. Right? So you, you write code that's going to take uh, a long time to execute and that you want to, to suspend and let something else run and then resume uh, ex execution once it's ready. So it's the same, the same idea. But what's really interesting is that it doesn't actually block your thread of execution. It, it suspends the coroutine but doesn't block the thread of execution. That's sort of confusing. Questions? What happens? Right. So you're, the, the question uh, for everybody, I don't know if anybody heard, um, what happens if a coroutine modifies the value that another coroutine has access to? Um, and the answer is that it, it changes it. Yeah, they both have access to that same, to the same scope, and they will change it. 
Yes. You, well, you, you, you get access, you basically change the, the other value, right? You, your value has been changed under. Yeah, but some, some sequence of switches have happened to the home I don't Yeah, so I mean, you, you have the same situation as y what you would have with, with uh, non-thread safe uh, variables, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same, the same idea. I haven't actually written any coding code that runs into that. So yeah, we're staying pretty basic uh, right now. And it's a really good question. I don't, I don't know what will happen. But um, I mean, I, I think it depends on, on the actual code, like what the actual code is doing. The, the results will be, I'd say, unpredictable, but uh, it'll. Pardon me? Um, you mean protecting access to variables? I don't know. That's a, another good question. I haven't, uh, I haven't tried, yeah. Yeah, but you, yeah. I mean, if you use a semaphore, you'll get into the same, same thing as, as threads, right? Like, if you're protecting with a lock, um, the, So yeah, thanks for actually yeah, adding. Line, <laughs> yeah, thanks for adding that. Actually, that's sort of what confused me a little bit at the beginning because it's the same thread, right? Like they're they're running on the same thread. Or at least what we're gonna look at right now, it's it's the same thread. You can get into more more advanced um, implementations where you have separate threads, but we're we're looking at coroutines as as units of um, of code that are running on the same the same thread, and like you, like you mentioned, it you can't have them executing at the same time. Like you know, you you've defined very well where one coroutine suspends and the other one resumes. So, any any more questions around suspending functions? And when we get to the end and we are actually running the code, we can play with some of those uh, some of those examples. <coughs> 
So what I'm going to do here is introduce some, some code. It's a, basically a scenario that we all do very frequently. Um, so I've, um, there, the Meetup uh, service, the Meetup page that we all use to sign up for, for uh, these events, it has an API. And so I thought, why don't we like, write a simple app that um, you know, if I give it a token or I log in, uh, it can fetch the, the user and fetch a list of all the meetups that this user attends or uh, is interested in. So that's a very sort of common use case that we all have to, to, to deal with. We, um, we connect to an API, we make a request, and once we have the result from that request, we need to make another request um, to get more information, right? So we're going to have two, two endpoints, and we can't call the second endpoint until we get the result from the first one. So that's the, sort of the, the scenario that I propose here, and that's the code that we're going to be looking at. And so to introduce the spending functions, I am going to show you the first very simple function here. Um, it's called fetch current user, and it returns uh, a user object. Again, all it does, it's, it goes to a, an API object that I've declared somewhere else in my class, and it says, give me the current user. And what I want you to notice is the suspend keyword that goes b before the, the function key declaration. So that's what's telling the compiler that this is a suspending function. This is going to suspend um, the coroutine that is running it and resume control to another coroutine. And There's a very subtle point here that uh, I'm just going to bring up now so that um, I can clarify it a little bit later, maybe in the next slide. I've sort of implied here that um, our get current user function in our API is also suspending, right? Um, this works because I'm in a suspending function. Fetch current user is a suspending function, so I can call a suspending function, as I uh, mentioned right here in the first point. And that's also why we can return the user object. We're not returning a promise or a future or, or an observable or anything like that. We're actually returning the user. It's been fetched from the API at, at that point when we return. Any questions about this function? I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. So if, if you want to have code that will suspend, that will um, be able to suspend the execution of a coroutine, you need to, to declare it as suspending. Right. Yeah. The only thing that's going to happen is that if I didn't put the suspend function here mm -hmm. and I'm calling an API that has a function that's suspending, it will give me an error. The compiler will say you, you can't you can't do that. You can't call that. And we'll we'll get into a, a good example of that very soon as well. I'll also show what we can do later on if our if we don't have control over our API. We may be using a library like Retrofit that doesn't actually produce suspending functions. Right? It won't deal with coroutines yet. But I hear Jake Wharton's working on it. Um, but if, <laughs> if we, let's say, are using a, an API class that we didn't write and we don't have control over, then I'll show what we can do to make this still work. OK. So now, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we want to start a coroutine somehow so that we can run these suspending functions, right? I said we cannot, we can't run the suspending fun function from a non-suspending function. So we have to start a coroutine so we can actually do this at some point. And earlier on, I talked about the create coroutine uh, function. And I said there are higher level functions that, that help us create these coroutines. And that's what we're going to look at now. So the first thing I'm going to show you is this code that looks pretty trivial. 
Um, I've introduced a fetch current user function. It returns a user. I assign it to a, to a, a variable. And then once I do that, I say, well, I'm going to update my view, some, some property of my view, with the user information. Probably take the name and put the name somewhere in the text view. So this is, a, this is gonna work, right? Uh, fetch, user, fetch current user is a suspending function, and we're in onResume in inside a fragment. So onResume is not a suspending function. Um, so this is very quickly going to give us this, this error. This is what you'll see, um, and you'll know that you've messed up something in your, in your code. So straightforward, suspend functions are only allowed to be called from a coroutine or another suspend function. So again, we get into this problem. How do we even get this started? And so there are these things that I don't, I don't remember if they're explicitly named adapters, but that's the best way to think about them. They're like adapter functions or builders, if you will. So these are these higher level uh, functions that call create coroutine and start a coroutine for your uh, suspendable computation, for your suspending function. And these basic functions that I'm going to go over, and this is really the rest of the, the presentation, are in the coroutines core library. The three main ones that I want to talk about today are launch, async, and run blocking. So we'll go in order, and I'll explain the differences between them. I think run blocking is probably pretty easy to see the difference uh, with the other two. But the, the first two, uh, the difference is not as straightforward. So we'll, we'll go through each one. And we'll look at some examples of how I use them in this very simple application that I've created for, for our meetup. And hopefully, we'll, um, we'll get a working app. So we'll start with launch, because it was the first one there. This is how launch is defined. If you open up the source code of the coroutines library, and you look at how launch is defined, you'll see that um, it has three parameters, and it returns a job. The three parameters that we have is uh, context, uh, a start, and a block. So the first two, there's a default value you don't really need to provide. Um, I'll explain context in a, in a little bit. Again, this is one of those things that I'm going to say, let's put a hold on it, and we'll get back to it. Um, but context is um, sort of a thread pool if you will. So a thread pool, you know what, let's pause it. The, there's a default value. I, I omitted it here for simplicity. But if you look at the source code, I, um, like I said, I, I, I took that out. But it will use a default, um, the, the common context, it's called. And also start has a default value. I also didn't put it here, because the default for start is to just start. It's, that's, what it's called, I think it's called default start, um, which means that there are other values that you can, that you can use. And the main one is um, lazy or lazily, I think it's called. So that means that you can create your coroutine, uh, or so you can launch your coroutine, but it won't necessarily run the code until you tell it to, so, or until you ask for, for the result. Um, and then the third, the third parameter, which is really what we have to provide, and the most interesting thing, is our code. What, what are we going to run? And this is our suspending function. Right? We introduced our suspending function in uh, the previous slides. And so this is what this is saying. You're going to get a um, function that is suspending. Right? And this function can return something. It doesn't matter what it returns. It's a, it's a unit in this case, because um, Launch, this is one of the peculiarities about launch, is that it doesn't matter. It gets ignored. Um, we, have a, we have a job as a return value. And this is so we can cancel it. Right? You can start something, and then if it's running for too long, or you no longer care, like you leave your fragment, you're, um, you're abandoning it, you want to cancel that job. So that's what the function that we're going to use looks like. As I mentioned uh, before, it will launch a new coroutine. And this won't block the thread. So I've already mentioned that coroutines don't, don't block the threads, but I'm going to keep making this point. Um, 
because I think it's important. And as I mentioned, it returns a reference to, to this coroutine. It will return the reference as a job. And you keep this job so you can cancel it. There you go, you can cancel. And I mentioned also before that it will start immediately by default, but you can start it lazily. And again, a very important thing about launch is that it doesn't have a resulting value. So, so when you wanna do some work, but you don't care about the result of that work, right? All you care about is that you can cancel it and that it completes at some point. Are there any questions about launch at all? No, okay. So I'll move to async. Uh, oh, never mind. I'm gonna move to an example first. Um, I think before I showed you an on resume function. Um, yeah, I showed you the on resume function that was gonna call a suspending function, but it was gonna give us an, uh, an error when compiling, right? So this is how we resolve that problem. We use launch. And we, I created this other function now just to make things simpler. Our, our Suspending function is gonna be called populate data, and it'll be tasked with calling the APIs and updating the views. So it's gonna go make the two API calls, and it's gonna update the views when it has enough data. And because it's suspending, then uh, we have to put it in this um, launch block, right? I said ignore um, context in the, in the last slide, and now I'm going to tell you about context again. If you see that UI parameter in there next to launch, that's a context. And UI is a special context, it's an Android context. So there's a special library for uh, coroutines in Android, and the main fun uh, functionality of that is to provide us with a UI thread kind of thing. So this is our UI context. Um, it's really interesting because if you notice, I tell it, launch it in the UI context, and run the suspending function, right? And I'm not switching between threads and the UI, uh, so between background or asynchronous computation and, and the UI context. I simply say, run this in the context of the UI and, and do what this function does. And yeah, after, after async, we're gonna get into the implementation of populate data. So yeah, that takes us to async. So I think it looks very much like launch um, with a couple of differences. One is that it's parameterized, right? So we no longer have unit as our uh, result type from our suspending function. We now have this, um, this type, T. And we don't return a job to be canceled. We return a deferred object, which has a type. Right, so now we can go back and think of like futures and promises and that kind of stuff, observables. Right, but we, we have something that's going to give me a value at some point in the future. We don't have it yet, but it's gonna give me something. And that's what deferred is. It represents, it represents a coroutine, so you can still cancel. You can cancel your deferred, but also it is a promise that you'll get something at some point in the future. And that's the main difference between uh, async and launch. Basically, if you need a resulting value, you use async. If not, you would use launch. Questions about async? Yeah. Can you use the generic type to return the state of the coroutine? Um, yes, but so your your sus your suspending function is not a coroutine. It's suspendable computation. 
you have a core routine that calls your suspendable computation. Your, 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 suspe sorry, your suspending function. Um, so your suspending function is basically a sus the suspend only tells the core routine that's calling it that that is a point where it can suspend. The core routine can suspend, right? The suspending function will still return, um, like it'll, it'll, it'll run through and return something. And it may suspend inside if it calls another suspend uh, suspending function. I actually do have a small example about that later. But yeah, there's no, there's no state in the suspending function per se that you, that you can return. Like, this is, this is the, re the return value of your function. So whatever function you pass it, whatever the return type of that function is, is going to be the return, the, the type of your deferred object, right? So it's really the, the re return. It, it needs to have a return statement, basically, is what I'm saying. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's a, it's a lambda. You pass it a lambda, basically. So yeah, just a block of code. Um, yeah, so in this case, in this case, um, this block that holds populate data, that's, that's a lambda, that's a, that's a code I'm, I'm passing it, right? But I could have 10 more lines in there. In fact, I could have the implementation of this in there. I just, for code cleanliness, I chose to do it this way. Um, what do you mean by override? So I think I think it's a library function. Yeah. So you 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 can you can create other other functions that start coroutines. Um, yeah, I mean you you can come up with something similar to this. I, I I'm not very creative, but yeah. Are there any other? Yeah, like mark, uh, marker implications. Yeah. They identify something that can be co-routinable. Yeah. Um, and you can actually see that. If I go here to my activity, um, no, where's my fragment? Oh, it's very small. You probably can't see it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Presentation mode. I just don't know if this is going to show the markers. Oh yeah, it will. And okay, so I, w I was going to show this later, but I'll just get ahead just so you guys can see what we're talking about. This is what I was just showing you before. This this piece of code here. Um, right next to populate data, you'll see there's some marker here. It has an arrow with a squiggly line across it. That's saying this is a suspension point. That's very important, not just visually for the developer, but for the compiler as well. The compiler needs to know where your, the suspension points are, because that's how coroutines are implemented, right? That's where that's how it will determine um, which continuation objects to to build. So it can actually suspend and then resume computation later. So we got a little bit ahead here, but just wanted to to show you that. Yeah. Yes. Well, w yeah. W whenever you make a call to a suspending function, it's telling the compiler uh, the the coroutine that's hosting this may suspend at this uh, in this point. It won't it won't necessarily suspend, but you, you're telling it this is a point where it will it will it could suspend. I'm not sure I follow that. Question. Suspending a 
Let me go back again to this slide. Okay. So our coroutine, our coroutine is not populate data, right? Our coroutine is the block that hosts populate data, right? Let's say I had a log statement before populate data and a log statement after it, just because those are the simplest statements that we can come up with, right? The compiler will know that everything in those two brackets is a coroutine. So that's a coroutine, right? And it'll know that that coroutine has one suspension point. And the suspension point is at the call to populate data. The log statements won't suspend it, right? Like, unless we declare some log library that suspends, but let's not do that. Um, but if you just use plain log uh, statements, then those, that's, that's part of a coroutine that doesn't suspend, right? The compiler knows this will not suspend but I may need to suspend this coroutine. Again, the coroutine is everything from here to here, right? So it'll say this block of code is a coroutine and it may suspend at this point in time. That's the only point this coroutine may suspend at. Yes. Cool, okay. So let's look at the async um, details. I think I already talked about all of them. Uh, really, um, also starts immediately. You can also start it lazily. It can also be canceled by canceling the deferred object, and it has a, a future resulting value. And so, what did I use? Where's my code? What did I use um, async for? Well. We talked about this populate data function that I introduced in a previous example, and I said we're going to fill it in, and here it is. I want this to show my uh, progress indicator because I want the screen to tell the user that something's happening while we go to the APIs. So I said I'm gonna show this progress indicator, then I'm gonna go to the, U to the API and retrieve a user, and then I'm going to, once I get that result, I'm going to update the username and I'm gonna take the user ID and go call the API again with the user ID and fetch a list of meetups that this user belongs to. And then we'll also display that list and now we're done, so we remove our uh, progress indicator. This only has one suspend function, so it only uh, has one concept, I guess, from coroutines here. What's really interesting here is that I, I sort of um, uh, promoted coroutines as, like one of the motivations was that you could write code that is asynchronous in nature, but looks like synchronous code. And the fact that we don't have callbacks, right? Like if you look at this function, this is something very common. We all do this on a daily basis, right? We do something to the UI, go to fetch something from disk or network and use that and do something to the UI again. But we usually have callbacks. Whatever library we're using, there's some, some form or another of a callback. And this doesn't have that. Like this is what our program does. I, when I explain what the program did, um, this is it. Like basically that does everything, right? And there's not a single callback. So that was one of the motivations and that's why I wanted to show this function here. And then I'm gonna show you the async, um, async part of this. Uh, in, in that function, I have a couple of fetches. So fetch current user and fetch meetups for user. So I've further cleaned up my code by doing that. And so I've declared these functions as returning, uh, being a function that creates a coroutine using the async function and returns a deferred value. So you can just see that here. I have an async uh, block that calls the API get current user and an async block that gets, that calls the API get user meetups. Um, you guys can take like five, 10 seconds to take a look at that. Now you should see that something's wrong here because I told you that async would return 
a deferred with a type, right? And I'm taking that and I'm assigning it to a variable that I called user and a variable that I called meetups. So I've actually kind of cheated when I introduced the populate data um, because we need to do these things. Okay, so let's go back to the suspending function. A weight that I've just introduced and that I'm gonna go into detail later, a weight is a suspending function, also in the coroutines library. So if I were to look at this code in Android Studio again, I would see that arrow with the squiggly thing right at the two um, assignment statements where I do user is equal to fetch current user and meetups is equal to fetch meetups for user. What does that mean? That this suspending function, the main suspending function that, we, as we were talking about before, a suspending function can call another suspending function. In this case, it's calling the await suspending function. That thread of execution, or that, that coroutine, can suspend there in the await. And if you think about it, we have to. We have to suspend there because we're waiting for something, right? If we didn't, our UI would be blocked. In, in fact, Android would, uh, would kill it killer app because we're doing networking on the main thread. Um, so we're going to await uh, in a little bit, but I wanted to, to, show you, to show you that. And I think it will reinforce the concept of suspending functions, right? The fact that we have this thing that, that's, uh, that, that's synchronous, if you will, in, in the, the nature of the code, the way we've written it, but actually is suspending at certain points in time. Any questions about this, this code sample? Await, um, okay, so await is a function on deferred, right? Remember, um, remember that our fetch functions are returning a deferred. They're not returning a user, they're returning a, a deferred a deferred object of type user. So what that is basically saying is, wait for this deferred thing and give me the actual object. So it's, it's basically waiting while you, while you go to the network and come back and, um, and parse and do all that stuff that you have to do and you get an, an object back, right? Uh, Wes, do you have a question? Um, no, it's dark magic. Um, <laughs> um, it actually kind of is. I, I'm, I have yet to find exactly how it knows. I just, I, because we've told it that it's a suspending function, um, it won't run that inside the, um, the on, on the UI thread. Yeah, it's... I saw it a couple of months ago. I went in th th through the, the source code of, of the Android coroutines library. And really, it's all, all it's doing is switching back to the main thread. Um, it has a handler. So that, so that UI object that I, that I talked about uh, in the previous slide, it, it has a handler, and it just switches back and forth. And exactly when it does that, I can't, I can't quite remember. But um, yeah, I, I think for, for the purpose of today, it's magic. I hope everybody's okay with that. <laughs> okay, and the last one that I, the last, um, what do I call it? Adapter or um, builder uh, that I wanted to introduce is run blocking. So you would actually not use this probably in like your actual application code, but this is interesting when you want to test stuff, right? Again, asynchronous code becomes a pain when you want to test things because um, now you have to make your tests wait for stuff, and you don't want to introduce callbacks in your tests. So we can wrap things with run blocking, which will also run a coroutine. The difference here is that it will, uh, it will block the thread. So I kept saying that coroutines won't block threads, and I kept reinforcing that precisely because I wanted to show this and say this, um, this adapter will block your thread. So you only want to do it in 
in cases where you're running like a console application or you want to run something for your console and test um, and on your unit tests or anything like that. So this is even simpler. Um, there's no start uh, parameter. You can't start it lazily. As soon as you, you, uh, you call it, it, it goes and it blocks until you're done. You also have a context, just like the other two. And you don't need a deferred or a future or anything like that because you're blocking. So by the time you want run blocking to return, the, the suspending function that it runs has already finished and it has a return value and therefore it can also return it here. So I, I don't think that's um, anything too crazy, but um, like I said, the one thing to take away from this is that it blocks. And it's pretty easy because it's in the name. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, just like the other functions, we can, we can um, invoke suspending functions using run blocking from any uh, non-suspending code, right? So if we're in a main function, if we're in our on resume, not that you should do this in on resume, but um, anywhere where you're not in a coroutine, this will create a coroutine wrapper around your code and block. Okay, if I read that, it's gonna be the third or fourth time I say it, so I'm gonna skip it. Same thing, resulting value. Okay, and so because they all have an example and because we know we all have to write tests with our code, um, I've added this example here. So now we have a test. We're gonna test populate data. Right, it's a very simple test and it's actually not even complete. Uh, it's not exhaustive, but the, the interesting thing is what I was telling you before, that we can use it to wrap a suspending function and something that we know is asynchronous and it's gonna take a while. And we just wrap it and then it makes the testing thread block until it's done. And then we can verify that the interactions that we wanted to happen happened. And that's it, so that's how that's how we would use ROM blocking. Any questions about ROM blocking? So ROM blocking would be an example of making something that's asynchronous and difficult to test, then run it in sequence so you can make it more testable. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it bridges that, that gap. And that's why I thought it was interesting to also introduce this one. Okay. Okay. So we're back to await. Um, I, I, I went into more detail than I thought I was going to in the previous uh, four slides ago, I can't remember how long ago. Uh, but as I, as I mentioned before, it, it's a function on deferred and it will make the coroutine suspend until the deferred value is available and then it will resume once that's the case. So. I don't think we need to spend too much time here anymore because we, we, we saw this already. Uh, I will use it to reinforce that it does not block the thread that it's running on and that it resumes when computation is complete. That's how it's declared. It's pretty, uh, pretty simple. It's a suspending function and it returns your type, right? So remember, this is inside of deferred uh, with type T. So it knows what, what type of uh, object to return. And we already saw the example as well, but I'll, I'll show it. Uh, this, this function, I've actually modified it here a little bit. If you remember uh, a few slides back, our fetch functions, so our fetch current user function and our fetch meetups list function, they used to return a deferred, of, um, a deferred object with a value, or with a type. Um, I've changed it a little bit just to have a, a fresh example here, really. Um, just a different way of implementing it. If we want it to be maybe a little more, if we want to simplify our populate uh, data function, which wraps that, we could put the async block inside fetch user and wait there. And since it's already a suspending function, that's completely okay to do that. Um, it depends on your style. You probably want to call it out explicitly. The other thing I wanted to do with this example is um, I don't know, like half an hour ago, I think I promised you that I would show you a way to um, 
make your API calls suspending if you weren't if you didn't have control over your API code if you were just using something somebody else wrote. Um, this now doesn't assume that our API is a suspending function, right? Our get current user, it no longer has to be a suspending function. It has to be a block. Well, yeah, it makes sense for it to be a blocking function here because we wanted to return the actual user object. But it's, it's no longer, uh, has to be implemented with coroutines. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions about um, await? Okay. And so I'm going to introduce one last function. Um, it's called delay. And delay, it's sort of like a wait, but you're not waiting on anything. You're just delaying. So the best analogy here is thread.sleep, right? Um, I have a confession to make. I didn't actually integrate into the Meetup API. So when I was testing this, and when I show you the code, um, the best way for me to test things was to introduce some artificial delays in a mock API class. And so I used delay, right? And I think that's the code I'm going to show you here. Yeah. That's sort of what I did. I created a mock implementation of my API, my suspending function. It will delay one second and then return something. Um, it helped me get my point across. And um, yeah, if you, if you wanted to, to write some testing code as well, you probably don't want to end up hitting real servers. You want to, to mock your API. So this helps you sort of simulate that network delay. Um, very straightforward. Like I said, it's like thread.sleep, but it doesn't block the thread. Instead, it suspends the coroutine. So it's exactly the coroutine equivalent of thread.sleep. Questions about delay? I don't see any. OK. OK, so I'm going to start wrapping it up soon. Um, I'll just make a few notes about this whole coroutines uh, stuff that we've been looking at. Um, it's available as, um, as a library. Um, the, the, the module name is Kotlin X coroutines Android. Oh, sorry. This is just the Android module, and I was talking about the UI context. So all the coroutines are available as a, as a separate uh, module that you need to include in your Gradle file. But there's a special one that if you're writing Android code, or if you're writing coroutines code in Android, um, you need to include. And it's the one that will give you the UI context. So we all saw it. I said it's magic. Um, this is it. Uh, go look at the source code. It's interesting and surprisingly simple. OK. And I don't know if I uh, said this, but coroutines are in experimental status. Uh, that means that they're not finalized yet. The design hasn't been completely proven by the development team. They're pretty stable, but there's still like there's no guarantees. Um, so they were only introduced in March of this year, so in Kotlin 1.1. Uh, yeah, the, the, the implementation is different from other languages that use something like this. Like, um, like C Sharp has the same concepts, concepts of async and, uh, and await. And the implementation is different. It hasn't been proven. So they want to experiment with it and gather feedback from developers. So if you do play around with them and run into any issues, uh, file a bug with JetBrains, they'll be more than happy to, to look at that. And eventually, they will drop the experimental part of the package, and they'll just move everything to Kotlin next like coroutines. In the meantime, they've kept it there as a reminder to everybody that if your app is running crucial code, you maybe don't want to ship with coroutines yet. And if you don't add this to your Gradle file and you use coroutines, you're going to get a warning. So if you want that warning to go away, just add this block of code, and it will leave you alone. I also have this slide. Um, you don't have to write this down. I, I'll post the slides um, through us through on, the, on the Meetup channel. Um, but this is, these are some of the, the, the blogs or, or videos, talks, 
that I found really interesting and really helpful while trying to learn it. Some of them are very dense because they will go into the implementation of coroutines. And if using coroutines is not very straightforward, you can just imagine what the implementation of coroutines is like. Um, if you're interested, these are some great places to, to check out. And that is it for me.